The forum is going to begin. It is our honor to have Professor Kenneth Young to give us an introduction on the Shaw Prize 2018. May I invite Professor Young, please? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to this public forum organized by the Science Museum in collaboration with the Shaw Prize Council to provide an opportunity for members of the public to meet and listen to the Shaw Prize laureates 2018. The Shaw Prize was established in the year 2002 to promote and foster scientific research worldwide. It is an international award dedicated to honoring individuals regardless of race, nationality, gender, or religious belief, who have achieved significant breakthroughs in academic and scientific research or applications, and whose work has resulted in a positive and profound impact on mankind. Since the year 2004, the prize has been awarded annually for distinguished and significant achievements in the following three scientific disciplines, astronomy, life science and medicine, and mathematical sciences. Each prize consists of a medal, a certificate, and a monetary award of 1.2 million US dollars. This is the 15th year in which the prize is awarded. The 2018 prizes were awarded just two days ago with the chief executive officiating. We are pleased and grateful that the laureates, in, ad in addition to, to lectures at three universities yesterday, are here today for this forum. I will leave it to the moderators to introduce the laureates. I just want to say at the very outset how impressed I have been by their total dedication over decades in working on problems of importance to humanity. Important not only for the impact on our lives and our health, but also important as part of the rigorous and relentless search for truth and understanding that distinguishes us from other species and define us as humans. While the Shaw Prize celebrates great achievements of the recent past, it is also intended to promote similar, dare I say, even greater efforts in the future. The science of tomorrow belongs to young people and we are very pleased to see so many young future scientists here today. I'm sure you will all be captivated, as I certainly shall be. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yang. The forum is going to begin with the session on astronomy. It is our honor to have Professor Ming Chong Chu to be our moderator. May I invite Professor Chu, please? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great honor to introduce our first speaker, Shaw Laureate in Astronomy 2018, Dr. Sean Lu Puget. I learned it many times. I'm still not doing it very well. Sorry about that. I'm really happy to see so many young students here. I still remember when I was in Form 2, junior high school. I first heard about the Big Bang Theory. I heard about people setting up an antenna and pick up this cosmic microwave background, which is the first strong evidence that the universe was once hot and dense. And we're picking up this radiation from this hot fireball from the early universe. I was deeply moved when I heard that. And that's a large reason why I, I decided to take up physics as my career. Over the past 20 years or so, there have been tremendous progress in measuring these cosmic microwave background. We can now measure these fluctuations in the cosmic wave, micro, microwave background to such high precision that we really learn a lot about the early universe and the evolution of the universe. I myself believe that if we go forward in time 500 years, let's say, and we look back in history, this must be one of the most significant achievements 
that we human beings can be proud of, that we can really measure these radiations from early universe and we learn about it. So in fact, we have a picture here. From these fluctuations, we learn so much that we should be proud of. Now, of course, these CMB photons don't come to us without distortions. There are all kinds of distortions of the signals we have to pass through plasmas, maybe produced from the first stars. To pass through gas and dust, especially when they have to penetrate through our own galaxy before we can detect them. So it's a very important work for scientists to be able to separate the true signal from Big Bang from the so-called foreground, all these distortions, we have to understand them. And our speaker today, Dr. Puget, is a hero. He has done so much. Uh, he's the principal investigator of the high-frequency instruments on a Planck mission, which is a state-of-the-art measurement of this CMB uh, data. On one hand, using this instrument, he produced high-precision measurements of the cosmological background. At the same time, using this instrument, he measured the infrared background, and as well as gravitational lensing and many other distortions of the signal, so that we can separate the signal from the background. And at the same time, from the background, he taught us many things about how the stars were born, how the galaxies evolved, the nature of the interstellar medium, and so on and so forth. So it's really my great honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Let's join me to welcome Dr. Jean-Luc Puget. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And uh, I'm very happy to uh, being here and present to you uh, what I have done in the past and explain to you in simple words, I hope, uh, what we learn about the universe. I will just start to introduce myself uh, so you know what was my personal history and uh, it could maybe give ideas or uh, wishes for the younger members of, of this audience uh, to go into science. Uh, uh, my father had only received uh, elementary education, didn't go even to, to high school, and he was very sorry about that, and that's probably the reason he pushed my brother and myself to, to, to do uh, studies as, as far as we could. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, the they would, he would be probably, uh, with my mother, who was a midwife, uh, very happy to uh, know uh, uh, that I got basically a very prestigious prize, like the show prize. Uh, let me go to astronomy. Astronomy is one of the oldest science, and uh, uh, try to, this science tries to, to answer basic questions that humanity has been, mankind has been asking because they see stars uh, in the sky at night, the moon, sun moving around, and so they wonder and, and try to build explanation for what they see. Uh, later, uh, science answers to these questions started to come. I will not go uh, to antiquity uh, and measurement of the radius of the Earth, uh, 300 years be before the beginning of our era, but uh, with Galilei, Galileo, Galilei uh, just uh, uh, remembers that uh, uh, what he did was basically inv inventing 
a telescope with lenses. Uh, and uh, what it did with that was to observe, uh, especially the, the, the phase of the, of the of Venus, uh, similar to the, to the moon. But he also observed one thing which was very important. He observed an ex the explosion of a star uh, uh, in, in 1604. And that proved that basically the sky can change. And so that was a very important element that uh, you could say. In the fundamental questions people ask is, is our world, and I use specifically the, C, the, the term world, the world uh, was basically what we could see, what we could knew. And the world has been expanding, in fact. Uh, the universe is expanding, but, but the world we know has been expanding uh, also over the centuries. And uh, Giornaldo Bruno uh, was one who, who asked, can the universe be infinite? And that was, that was a fundamental question. And could there be other worlds? And, and that was a question that was not fitting with, uh, with religion and, and the philosophies of, of the time. And uh, that's why he, he was condemned by the Inquisition and, and died on, uh, uh, on the fire uh, in, uh, in Rome. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's less dangerous to, to do cosmology these days, luckily enough. Uh, what we look at the sky, uh, we see uh, by uh, uh, dark nights the Milky Way. The Milky Way is, is this band, which is uh, like milk, whitish, and uh, it's, it's quite extended. And it has, you would certainly see uh, if you do that, uh, see these dark things. That's just cloud of gas and dust, out of which stars form. And there is a cycle which goes through forming stars and stars getting to the end of life and finishing in various form, depending on their mass. And for example, in big explosions, like the one Galilei observed. In fact, when you observed with a satellite, the COBE satellite, which was the first to investigate the cosmic microwave background, which is this rel relict of the Big Bang that I will talk about later, you could see that the Milky Way, you could see the stars in the Milky Way, which are just in this disk. And you could see also, with the, another instrument on the same satellite, the dust emitting uh, in, the, in these dust clouds in the Milky Way, and in fact, also the dust emitting in the solar system. The solar system has also dust between the planets. Edwin Hubble observed the galaxies, which were diffuse, kind of similar to, to the Milky Way. You could see uh, the Magellanic Clouds or the Andromeda Nebulae. And he demonstrated that these were not gas. It was other large gathering of stars, 10 to 100 billion stars. And so they were basically uh, other uh, universe, other, which was known before. The stars around us were basically stopping at a distance of about a thousand a few thousand uh, light years. And he demonstrated that basically there are many galaxies uh, similar to, to, to our own. Uh, very spectacular one is here. Uh, and basically, the sun would be about two thirds of this thing, and we, were in, we are inside this disk. And just and Wilson, in fact, discovered the microwave background, which was predicted by theoreticians 70 years ago, saying that the expansion that Edwin Hubble observed, if it has been going for a very long time, the universe might have been much denser 
and probably much hotter before. And so they predicted that they would be a relict of that. They used, uh, in fact, they were not looking for that. They were doing transmission at what was very high frequencies for the time in radio waves with this very strange machine collecting, you know, uh, radiation like that in this uh, big metallic thing and, and detecting them here. And they were worried about having a noise which was they could not understand in, in their detection and they realized that it was coming from the sky and it was coming from all the direction of the sky and that was recognized to be, uh, to be the relic radiation that some people were in fact building an experiment to detect at Princeton uh, about 50, 30 miles away uh, from, from that. Now, my career has been on observing some of these things and observing with cryogenic satellite. What is cryogenic satellite? It's one which for the telescope or the detectors are cooled at very low temperature. And this technology was only available pretty late. And, and the COBE satellite, for example, tested that this, the distribution in frequencies were, was following what, what is called a Planck function. Planck was a, was a great physicist who introduced, in fact, quantum mechanics. Uh, at the same time, Einstein was describing gravity uh, with general relativity, which are the two ingredients for now the, model, the cosmological models. And you could see that basically the, the red curve, which is what was predicted, uh, and the measurement, which is a sm small dark dot, black dot, are exactly following each other. So that was what convinced everybody that we, we could observe uh, something which was happening very early in the Big Bang. As you know, if you get the light from a star, uh, it could be uh, this star could have evolved and changed. We would not know it before the light comes to us. So you, you, you are basically looking at, at the universe with a delay. A few thousand years when you look at the stars of the Milky Way, when you look at galaxies million or billion of years, and beyond the galaxy, to our surprise, there is something which comes from the very beginning of the universe. That's an electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves to gamma rays and X-rays. What we see and what was studied for a long time by astronomers is optical, visible light. We can see. All that is absorbed by dust by uh, the atmosphere, sorry, by molecules, and dust sometimes, and pollution. And you can see that basically we can understand stars, stars, starlight absorbed by dust and re-emitted at longer wavelengths, and something which is very prominent. It's 95% of the energy which is coming outside of the Milky Way. And that's the microwave background which was predicted. This one is extremely uniform. It has nothing to do with that, which is superposition of stars, superposition of galaxies, and so on. And it's, it's not only uniform, but most of what we get. Cryogenic satellite started uh, in 1983. There was a COBE satellite, two observatories, one from the European Space Agency, 1998, Spitzer, and so on. So before that, we could not basically detect and observe and check predictions. The Planck satellite that we did build had a, this detector here, which is the high frequency one, uh, in which this box is at four Kelvin four degrees above absolute zero, and the detectors in it are at 0.1 degree uh, absu above absolute zero, which gives an enormous sensitivity. The Planck satellite is, a, what we say, a gas factory. There is piping and so on everywhere because there are three active coolers, three refrigerators going from uh, 
the uh, hot temperature of, of the solar panel to all the way down to 0.1 degree. What is the, the observation we make? We cover the whole sky. This satellite has been brought by the big Ariane rocket 1.5 million kilometers in the line which joins Sun Earth and which is outside of that and which is a semi-stable point. In fact, you would understand that between the Sun and the Earth, there is a point where the gravity of the Earth and the gravity of the Sun balance each other. The system is, is also rotating. The Earth is rotating around the Sun. So it makes, with the centrifugal force, there is another point, which is this also point semi-stable, and that's where the satellite was. And so we mapped, it, it's spinning, this, this satellite has a spin axis here, and so it's spinning, and so the beam from the telescope is just <coughs> describing a sky circle every minute, and then as the Earth goes around, in six months it covers the whole sky, and in the other six months it covers the whole sky also. In fact, we did five surveys of this kind. And we have a number of frequencies in the high frequency instrument and the low frequency instrument. And what you see here is basically now the dust emission in the, uh, in the galactic disk, in the, as, which is basically the middle of the Milky Way, as you, you can see by eye. You can see basically that the dust emission dominates here. And when you get to these frequencies, you would see the same image exactly in all frequencies, that's the cosmic, infra, the cosmic background. And we could, using all these frequencies and combining them, some which has more emission in the dust, some we have more emission in the cosmic background, did this all sky map from the dust in the galaxy with this filamentary structure which looked like cirrus. And this interstellar cirrus is are like the atmospheric cirrus, they're turbulent. You could, see, you could basically see something which is, looks like, very much like cirrus. And in fact, we could map the magnetic field of the galaxy using the polarization of the detectors, which was also a very important measurement. And so that's the image when we remove all the foreground and the systematic effects and it took five years to get really to the stage we are now when we are releasing for astronomers all over the world all this set of maps. In fact, uh, it, was, it was quite interesting when we released these this maps in 2015 uh, to show that basically even uh, the International Herald Tribune, but the, uh, the New York Times, Le Monde, and so on, or the Financial Times, we are making the front page out of that. It means that basically humanity is interested in figuring out where do we come from. It's really a, a fundamental question for us. How the universe begin? How the solar system and the Earth begin? How life begin on Earth? How uh, eventually intelligent life uh, that we are the representative of uh, on Earth? human race developed. And so that's part of this exercise and I was attracted to fundamental question and I, led, I was led to that, which is the first one in time, but uh, uh, which is probably the simplest. All the other ones are more difficult, they are more complicated and uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, so the, uh, we, we got to that, and so uh, uh, I would stop on, on, on that picture saying that uh, uh, the results we got are probably of interest to everybody, even if they don't know much about astronomy or physics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pouchier. Please take a seat here on the stage. The question and answer session is about to begin. May I also invite Professor Chu to take a seat on the stage to join the discussion.
I will tell you that, uh, that I was in, starting initially in theoretical physics and particle physics because I wanted to learn also about the forces uh, that we know, the electric force, the electromagnetic force, uh, the nuclear force, which uh, is holding the, the nucleus of, of atoms together and so on. And I, I was interested in... Uh, in doing, doing that. When I was finishing my, my master on, on, on theoretical physics, I heard a, a seminar uh, by one of my professors of theoretical physics, which uh, invented a model which was basically trying to answer a question. Particle accelerators, when you collide uh, at high energy, generate all sorts of particles, but they always generate a pair of particles, matter and antimatter, and it was it's a, it was a big problem to figure out why don't we see antimatter in the universe and trying when it's at contact with matter doing uh, annihilation and and building, uh, and so after that I started I, I said well I want to work on that, so I went to see him and, and he took me for an internship and then. My, my thesis advisor took me to CERN, the big accelerator, in, in Europe, uh, to, to work on, on this question about the annihilation. We know now that really the universe is, has not stayed symmetric. It was probably at the beginning, and there are some very small imbalance that we know in particle physics that can explain that. There is not an exact model, but I know at least we know that. So it, it's basically because of this question of origins that I love astronomy. But I could have done also fundamental physics, which would be another kind of that. Okay, um, this is fine. Let, let me ask a science question before we come back to uh, more non-science question. So what is the next step after Planck? The next step after Planck uh, is, is quite well defined. In fact, when people invented what was called the Big Bang, the name Big Bang was given by Fred Hoyle, who was a leading astronomer in England and who did not believe in what we call now the Big Bang. And it was for him a, a way to, to put down this, this theory, saying it's ridiculous, this theory of uh, going to infinite temperature and infinite densities at the beginning and expanding and so on. Is, so anyway, uh, he was proved wrong by the observation and the observation of, uh, of the, microwave, the microwave background. Until quite recently, we were not knowing, nevertheless, we had this expanding universe. And when I learned cosmology, uh, we were talking about in the parameters, there was the density of the various components and so on, and there was a deceleration parameter, because it was obvious that basically the mass in, in particles, in, uh, in matter, hydrogen mostly in the universe, uh, still stars are mostly form of hydrogen, uh, the weight of that would slow down the, the, the expansion, and that what was observed up to the time, a few, ten, 10 years ago, where in the observation of the expansion of the universe, people realized that it had slowed down, but quote-unquote recently, which is basically half of the age of the universe, five billion years ago, it started to re-accelerate. That's, that's strange, and that's still not fully explained. There are some kind of particles in the, in, in, in the physics, in the particle physics zoo, that can explain that because it they would, they would create uh, acceleration instead of attraction, uh, repulsion. Uh, the Higgs boson is of this kind. So we didn't know any particle of that, of course, scalar boson, uh, but Higgs boson is one. So we know that there is something like that, and so the same can be explained in the beginning which means 
if we, if we have something like that at the beginning, there would be an accelerated expansion. And this accelerated expansion now has a name, it's inflation. And so the big question is inflation, and can we test it? And there was generic prediction of inflation. And all but one were tested positively by Planck, which is quite, quite amazing. That was, uh, and I, I could go explain to you what they are, but one of them is not tested. When you generate fluctuations, which are quantum fluctuations at the, in the early universe, the only mechanism we could imagine, uh, two Russian physicists, uh, Muranov and Chibizov, said, well, it has to be quantum fluctuation. Quantum fluctuation are very small, explaining galaxies. That, that uh, did not make it, except if we had an extremely brutal expansion at the beginning. So that, that solved that problem. And so generated, that would generate uh, fluctuation of energy density. It would also generate gravi gravitational waves. Gravitational waves were predicted by general relativity. All this period, one century ago, uh, where quantum mechanics and general relativity are the basis of, the, uh, of these predictions. In fact, uh, the predictions were made in this field, much better than the observation. And gravitational waves were predicted by general relativity. It was controversial if we could measure them. Einstein went back and forth. <laughs> it, yes, it exists, but, uh, and we can measure it. No, we cannot measure it. <laughs> yes, we can measure it, and so on. Well, as you know, uh, we now detected gravitational waves. They, would, they should be gravitational waves coming out of inflation. And the microwave background polarization has a very specific mode called B mode. And I will not try to, to, to expand on that, but this would be so Planck and BICEP, which is a, a ground based experiment at South Pole. The, the team, the BICEP team, thought they, they, they had discovered these gravity waves in a collaboration with Planck. It was unfortunately demonstrated that they had not detected that, they had detected the B modes from the dust. Too bad. So now, the next step, sorry for taking long, but the next step is that. It's trying to find enough sensitivity to see where are the gravitational waves, the primordial ones. Thank you, and I'd like to add that this next step of trying to measure the gravitational wave imprint on the CMB relies heavily on Dr. Puchet's work. Without his work, we would not know even if we measure it. So it's really his achievement. Okay, next question. How can you balance your research life and your family? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> With difficulty. <laughs> but, but she was working, and she was working pretty hard on our field. So, uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, in, in the interviews, which, which is in the videos, which uh, were, were done uh, uh, for the show prize, uh, they also asked my son, my two sons, uh, and uh, they, of course, said, well, I was very often traveling and, and very busy and so on, but yeah. at the same time, uh, let them uh, go to, to science studies, so they didn't get disgusted <laughs> of science studies, and one of them got a PhD in applied mathematics and so on, so, and the other one is an engineer, so I think we didn't, I didn't do too badly in trying to combine these two <laughs> things. <laughs> So you don't want to share your secrets, how you can balance it? <laughs> okay. Um, next question is back to cosmology. So first of all, thank you. 
Your research tells us what happened in the past. Can you predict what's going to happen in the future? Will our universe have an ending? And what will it look like? That goes back to what I was saying about inflation and the inflation phase that we are watching the universe go through. Uh, first, if you do just extrapolate uh, that, what, what the physicists know is that vacuum, what we call vacuum in physics, is not vacuum with nothing. It's vacuum in terms of no particles, no, no photons, no radiation, but basically quantum mechanics says that you generate spontaneously particles and antiparticles which re -annihilate. So there is an energy density in the vacuum, which is something which would basically act uh, uh, and, and provoke inflation and, and acceleration. The problem is, uh, is that what the, uh, the director of T now is 10 to the power 120 larger than what is measured in laboratories for the vacuum energy. So what that says is that we don't understand that's a big an enormous question mark, the question mark at, uh, at the 10 to the uh, power 120. Now, we could describe the inflation as a change. Don't know. We know also that the universe is much bigger than the one we observe, 13.8 billion years, light years away. If we wait more, we would just see the same thing but just another layer, another layer of, of that. But the geometry is flat. The, there is no curvature at large scale. So it's basically statistically the same thing we would see for not only just beyond what the horizon, but the universe is much, much larger than we know now from Planck, that it's much larger than, than what we observe. And the idea that people manipulate is that the, the Big Bang was just a change in the, in the vacuum energy. Why, how? So there are ideas far reaching which says that. Coming back to the question, so if you keep the, the dark energy, as we call it, for lack of a better definition, which is this uh, which is creating this re-acceleration, re the, the universe will dissolve uh, very rapidly. Uh, now, could there be other changes of, of, of the vacuum and so on? That's a question. So, so people call that multiverse, uh, that far away in, in, in the much bigger universe than we don't see, you could have other properties of this kind. So, that's not observable, at least for what we understand now. So the question of what the, you know, what the universe will become would rely on something we don't know anything about, which is what created basically these transitions. So too bad, I don't have the answer, and I think not, nobody has the answer for the time being. Okay, the next question. Can we use cosmic microwave background to probe the origin of matter-antimatter matter asymmetry? No, not I know of. Uh, basically, if we know more about inflation, and we have, we have a, a diagram uh, in which we put, we, we, we put the amount of gravitational waves. We have not seen them, so it's basically an upper limit of that. And uh, when we look at these wiggles on, on the intensity of the microwave background, we look at the large scale and the small scale, and quantum fluctuation would be exactly uh, the same amplitude of that. Inflation has to stop, and so 
uh, when it stops, it took some time, and the big scale and the small scale didn't stop growing at the same time. So prediction, one of the prediction I was talking about is that it's not exactly what we could scale in variance, but a tilt of 4%. So coefficient, which is one for scale invariance, what we measure is 0 0.964, 3.5%. Knowing that the basic prediction is of order of three to four percent, I can tell you that when we measured, when we measured that and got that number, uh, <laughs> we were <laughs> pretty happy. It was hinted at from the W map at the barely three, three standard deviation, as we say for statistical analysis. Now uh, we, we 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 measured that uh, with eight standard deviation, so it's very well established. So, what, what we would learn is that model of inflations, uh, we have, there are many models of inflation, in fact, unfortunately. Uh, we have killed a, a large number of them by this diagram. If we detect the gravitational wave, we would, and that would eventually tell us how the generation of matter and antimatter and radiation which happened at the end of inflation would do. We all, the only thing we know is that there are enough imbalance in the physics to, to, to generate that, but the exact mechanism is not known. Okay, next question. What are the interferences in space stopping us from picking up the signals? I suppose that means the cosmological signals. What, what, the, what are the interferences oh yeah, interfer in space? There are, there are things which are uh, the, the CMB radiation, which comes from a time when the universe was a thousand times smaller in linear dimension, so a billion more dense. Uh, they come and for a very long time from this a thousand times smaller universe to basically 10 times smaller universe. The universe was neutral. It was fully transparent and that there is no very little. When, when galaxies and stars started to form, typically when the universe was 10 times smaller than it is now, uh, matter collapsed into this fluctuation, the, the one you see on the, the positive fluctuation, collapsed. And so when, when the radiation goes through the universe now, uh, it, it, go, it, it, it does wiggle through. We know from 1919, a century ago, that basically light is deviated by, by gravity. That was prediction of general relativity, which was measured, which was uh, the first. Uh, 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 test of general relativity. So we have lensing, as we call it. Lensing is, is bringing very interesting information. In fact, we combine the lensing with the, the other observations, and it's not a noisance, it's really a plus. Now, of course, the galactic emissions are the noisance. I talk about that. Uh, the intensity, which we can get rid of relatively easily. The, in the polarization, and the polarization is uh, what Planck did much better than, than the previous satellite WMAP, uh, the dust is 10% polarized when the, the, cosmic infra, uh, the cosmic microwave background uh, is 1% polarized. So the foregrounds in dust is much more polarized. And and so the signals are, the, the signal from the CMB, is, is from the cosmic micro, microwave background, from the cosmological signal, is never dominant, even in the better windows we have uh, in that, which is not the case for, for the intensity. In the intensity, you, you saw the, the maps I showed you, where you see at all frequencies the same thing. It's, it's, it's not an artifact of uh, analysis. It's, just the maps, so you see 
the CMB dominant there. Thus, uh, polarization is what suffers most, and, and that's the, the, the worst enemy of present and future cosmology. I must say, in that connection, I looked at the picture of the dust and the magnetic fields. The pictures look so great, so beautiful. It's amazing to see. It, it, it was amazing to me. I did also work. I started in cosmology and came back in cosmology to, to, to build the, the HFI instrument on, uh, on Planck. But in between, I, uh, I was driven by... Uh, I, I looked at the gamma rays very early when I was at Goddard Space Flight Center in 1970, looking for trace of annihilation that I didn't find. So it was the first negative sign, and we, we, we basically found others. And so basically, the bind symmetric cosmology disappeared. Uh, and I, I went basically into galactic physics. And, and I did that for, for, for a number of years. And seeing in the image I showed, the magnetic field in the, you can see the plane. And if you look at that image, uh, which is, uh, you can find on the web. Uh, you could see the, the field lines climbing like a chimney. And that's what people have been calling in galactic physics uh, chimney, which around star formation, blowing gas outside of the, of the lamp, it, it falls back. So just see that, just like that, it, it delineated like that. It's, <laughs> to me, it looks like um, Van Gogh's famous painting. Absolutely. Starry night, it's just, <laughs> just that, right? Yes, of the starlight, and I don't know how he saw the, <laughs> because when I look at the sky, I don't see that, but he, he saw that, so. Okay, another question for now. Um, what's the difference between cosmology and astronomy? Cosmology and astronomy. You could also see, say, astrophysics, so. Uh, uh, Astronomy now, uh, by contrast with astrophysics, and I'll come to cosmology, uh, is, is basically the, uh, the position of the point sources and the motion and so on. And so uh, the astrometric satellites, for example, like uh, EPARC or so Gaia, are, are really astronomy thing. The one which are detecting also sources are astronomy satellites in, in the sense of the astronomy which have no, been known from antiquity, basically. Uh, with a catalog of stars uh, in, in the third century also before. Uh, so astrophysics is the physical interpretation of that and of the properties of spectroscopy and so on and the interpretation of all of that. Cosmology and, and astrophysics started by basically trying to understand how stars generate their energy. Before nuclear physics, uh, it was a big problem. Uh, as soon as we understood that it was nuclear fusion doing that, we could build, people could build uh, models of evolution of stars of their luminosity as a function of the mass and so on, and that fitted very well. Uh, so it's not experimental. F astronomy is an observational field, not an experimental, that we can change uh, the conditions and, and do experiment changing <laughs> the conditions, but you have stars of all masses and different ages and so on, so statistically, you can very well do very clean physics and demonstration, like that. There is uh, a problem of, uh, of philosophy of science, of epistemology, uh, which is that cosmology is studying the universe at large scale. When you study galaxies, you can also do astrophysics because you have also statistics. When you study a single object with a single history, you are you, you don't have the statistics. <laughs> no, no statistics. You don't know if, if some of the physical uh, 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 constant uh, are changing, uh, how it, uh, you could. So 
the consistency of all observations of the universe on a large scale are what tells you that you are not doing just something which is pie in the sky. <laughs> and so this, this argument of, of consistency uh, that basically we, we use constantly uh, is our tool. We use statistics also by saying in the description we do, if we had another cut, for example, for the, for the microwave background, if we would, it, it's, a, it's a thin layer because it's a, it's a layer in, in time, in space, which, which is narrow because hydrogen recombines very suddenly. If we had another layer, what would it do? So we, we do the model and we say, Oh, what is the dispersion that we would see if we, if we could have? We call that cosmic variance. Mm -hmm. and, and we use that to say, if we are within, if a deviation is something which is not, which is not in the noise, which is, we have detected, but is within the statistics of the cosmic variance, mm -hmm. so, that's what we have introduced to try to deal with this question. It's not, a, it's not a, a, as solid answer as people doing experimental physics or experimental medicine or biology, um, because you can change your con the conditions and so on. So it's, it's a, a bit of ex an extreme one. Uh, I think the people who study uh, civilization and uh, anthropology are, are hitting the same problem that depending on the statistics they do and how big is the, the human group they are studying, when, when they get bigger and bigger, there are less statistics, statistics to do between different, different civilizations and so on to do. So there are probably, a, in the interpretation, they do a, a similar problem. I don't know exactly how they deal with that, but. Uh, Okay, I think uh, we only have a minute left. Is there any last question? If there's any student out there who'd like to ask in Chinese, I'm happy to translate it for you. Okay, this will be the last question. Well, but I will ask it in English. So, Professor, so, uh, what you did is very impressive. So. I want to ask, is it possible to use this kind of spectroscopy to do some kind of like space mining or predict, is it possible to like knowing when do we, our precious matter will be refilled in the space? Because you know that when a star dies, they explode and then we had the precious matter on Earth. So can we use this kind of spectroscopy to know this kind of things? Uh, if I understand, so you, you're asking uh, what's the matter we, we are made of and, and so on, which was built, in fact, inside stars. Yes, but when they come, to the, you can do, because you use spectroscopy to know those kind of chemistry, so is it possible to use this kind of chemistry to know when they come or so, so we can do this <laughs> kind of application? Yeah, not exactly, but uh, uh, what, one, of, one of my colleagues, uh, I work, together for 30 years, uh, François Boulanger, did uh, a study, for example, uh, of supernovae in the sort of past supernovae in the, in the vicinity of the sun. Because we find traces in the abundance of, of elements and, and various isotopes of the sign of rec relatively recent supernovae. So basically, part of the matter we are we are made of was built probably in big stars which exploded uh, uh, half halfway through in, in the age of the universe uh, because the solar system is is 4.5 billion years old out of the 13 so it's still a substantial fraction but the answer which might interest you is that it's it's in the vicinity and we still see the remnants the remnants of in the structure of the interstellar medium of, of, these, of these explosions. But uh, we, we understand very well the average uh, increase of carbon as a, 
nitrogen, oxygen, uh, up to irons, which is built in stars. Uh, as you might know, when you, fuse, when you do the fusion, when you are, arrive at iron, uh, you cannot, if you make fusion, nuclear fusion, you lose energy. So the, the heavier elements have been built in, in the explosion uh, because at that time, the star loses its, uh, its engine, and so it, it collapses inside and it blows everything away. So it's, this cycle uh, is very different from the low, the low mass element, what, what we are built of, than the heavy uranium and so on, which are built uh, in, in, in the explosion and not inside the star. Okay, so with that, let's thank uh, Dr. Puget again. Thank you very much. Please return to your seats on the floor. Now, we come to the session on mathematical sciences. Unfortunately, Professor Xiaoping Wang, Head Chair Professor, Department of Mathematics, the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, has other engagements and cannot join us today. It is our honor to have Professor Kenneth Young to be our moderator. May I invite Professor Young, please? Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, uh, second speaker, the laureate uh, in mathematical sciences. The Shaw Prize in Mathematical Sciences 2018 was, was awarded to Professor Louis A. Caffarelli for his groundbreaking work on partial differential equations. Professor Caffarelli was uh, educated both for his undergraduate work and his doctorate at the University of uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina. And he has worked successively, I'm not sure I got the order right, uh, at the University of Minnesota, at Kurong Institute at NYU, University of Chicago, Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, and now at uh, University of Texas at Austin. Instead of reading the rest of the citation, perhaps I, I could just say a few words about what are partial differential equations. Uh, it may sound a bit uh, abstract to uh, many people, uh, but partial differential equations are everywhere. The propagation of sound from the loudspeakers uh, to your ears satisfies some partial differential equation. A particular frequency of that sound satisfies perhaps a Helmholtz equation, uh, the electromagnetic waves that uh, travel from the uh, handheld microphones, not, not this one, uh, to the uh, amplifier satisfies another set of partial differential equations, Maxwell's equations. Uh, Dr. Puget talked about the expansion of the universe. The expansion of the universe satisfies Einstein's equations, uh, which is a much more complicated uh, of, uh, set of equations, which are, unlike the previous ones, Nonlinear, and the nonlinear ones are the difficult ones uh, to which uh, uh, Professor Cavarelli had made has made important contributions. In Hong Kong, uh, this time of the year, uh, I should remind you that two weeks ago we had a terrible, terrible typhoon. Typhoon, of course, uh, 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 violent air motions uh, satis satisfying uh, the Navier-Stokes equation, and that is one particular, uh, very nonlinear equation that Professor Caffarelli has worked on. Nonlinear equations, nonlinear partial equations are notorious, notoriously difficult, and they exhibit phenomena such as phase boundaries, regularities, or regularity or lack of regularities, uh, possible singularities. And in all these domains, uh, P Professor Caffarelli ha has made extremely uh, important contributions uh, over a number of years. Uh, may we now invite Professor Caffarelli uh, to share with us uh, his, some of his work. Okay, uh, I'm very glad to be here. It's a big honor and uh, it's a very exciting thing to... Oh, it's a very exciting thing to to be able to share my thoughts with a lot of uh, young people. So I have a small, uh, a small presentation of trying to say what is a partial differential equation. 
Then I will give you two or three examples of the equations I have been looking at, and then I guess I will go to the session of uh, questions and answers. So, um, uh, so uh, historically, uh, well, uh, I think, you know, historically people have been trying to uh, quantify the phenomena of life around us. You know, first was the stars, then was the flow of water, then was uh, the, the formation of, uh, of uh, elastic bodies and so on. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> so and then finally came Newton at some time that really uh, created the idea of rate of change, right? Newton's, well, Newton was the one that said, okay, we have a trajectory of a particle, then that trajectory, the particle has a velocity, which is the instantaneous rate of change of position, and it has an acceleration, which is the instantaneous rate of change of the velocity. And further down the line in history, uh, um, the Fourier wrote the equation for propagation of heat, which was that the infinitesimal change of change of the temperature uh, was due to the surrounding uh, heat of a given particle, okay? So this uh, idea of interest, uh, inter, uh, instantaneous rate of change is what characterizes the derivatives. And so the partial differential equations are equations where derivatives at this infinite rate of change in, the, in different directions are combined. In other words, the, the rate of change in space and the rate of change in time. How the rate of change in space modifies the rate of change in time. So, uh, <clears throat> this is more or less as was I was mentioning, right? The description of the evolution of continuum was a big stop, a big uh, step in in, uh, in science. Uh, and some examples are the deformation of elastic bodies and the uh, evolution of uh, fluids and gases and propagation then of temperatures, electrostatics, etc. So. Uh, let me, as an example, let me, I'm gonna, uh, let me give you an example, which is basically will be tried to an explanation of elasticity, right? So uh, you have, I suppose you have an elastic body, right? And you pull it from the sides. Then the elastic body deforms everywhere inside, right? But you would like to reconstruct how the, how uh, the forms inside. You know, this is a very specific thing. You pull it this way and everything changes a little bit but it's not immediate, right? It, it may be changes by expanding a little bit in the opposite direction, by expanding more in this direction. So you want to reconstruct what happens in the interior from the boundary, okay? And that's what partial differential equations are. Uh, this is what I was saying before, right? As, uh, uh, our equations or family of equations, some phenomena then, uh, have several different variables that need to be addressed when you want to describe it. And uh, some topic, typical uh, PD partial differential equations appear, for instance, in the deformation of a body, uh, the temperature of a bar that you have, you hit a bar at the end point, right? And the temperature propagates all over the, the bar, right? Uh, and so this is the effects that they'll get uh, of external perturbation uh, in all of these phenomena, okay? Uh, so, <clears throat> so what do we want partial differentials for? So suppose you, your, your objective is to describe water waves. So what is your final goal, right? So the final goal is a description of the shape, right, of a wave. Well, here you have a solitary wave in a channel, right, that is, uh, that is propagating, so this is, this uh, vertical uh, direction is time, right? And the horizontal is a space, and then here this way propagates with constant speed, okay? And see, this is described by a more or less simple or a very stationary state, right? Uh, but uh, if you want to look, for instance, at the, at the long-term effect on the beach of, of water, uh, of uh, water waves, and you have to create a much more complex 
phenomena involving partial differential equations. Uh, or propagation of a pollutant, you have a pollution in, uh, pollutant in, the, in, the, in, the, in the river or in the ocean, right? And uh, this is, uh, then you want to know how it uh, propagates, okay? Uh, so this, for instance, is this picture here is from a colleague of mine, uh, Clyde Clint Dawson at the Computational Hydraulics Group in the Institute for Computational Engineering and Science. And this is the way he predicted the propagation. Remember that uh, some years ago in the Gulf of Mexico, there was a big uh, oil spill because uh, one of the towers uh, broke. And so, uh, mm, so the scientists, uh, scientist, and in particular Clint, was uh, called to try to, uh, to, um, to predict how the, the, the spill was going to propagate. And he gave a very, very precise uh, spill uh, using uh, partial differential equations, you know, rather com complex systems of partial differential equations uh, that he uh, then, uh, for which he then did uh, numerical simulations, okay? So, so let me now give you sort of an informal uh, picture of uh, how the partial differential equation appears, right? So suppose that <laughs> you have a sort of a, an elastic membrane and you want to think of it as discrete. In other words, you want to say, okay, I'm going to look at a bunch of points. So instead of me thinking of a membrane, I will think about points connected by, by, by strings, right? And so if you have points connected by string, right, and you pull from a corner, for instance, then the, 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 whole, uh, the whole configuration deform in some particular way, okay? In other words, for instance, here you have to look at the strength of each one of the wires and see how they are deformed due to the uh, uh, surrounding uh, uh, def deformation, okay? So this will be the discrete approach, okay? And then you will have the discrete deformation. In other words, you pull and then each one of these little positions will move a little bit depending on how you pull, okay? So, uh, uh, <coughs> so if, you, if you pull gently from all the corners, you will see how this propagates, like you are pulling a little bit more to the, to, to the left, to the down than up, so the, the red, uh, the green become the red particles. Uh, and in a partial differential equation, what you do is you are looking at the lattice, which is thinner and thinner and thinner. It's really the elastic body, right? So you think a little bit as an elastic body as composed by particles all together. And then the, the computations I did before uh, discreetly, when I said I move uh, the, consecutive, the nearby uh, points, uh, this becomes a partial differential equation, right? As, as, as Newton pointed out, everything you can approach by an infinitesimal way of looking at it. And so you get a partial differential equation that says that uh, the derivatives of some coefficients, the coefficients of the formation of the derivatives of u are equal to some quantity f, okay? So what is the advantage of the PDE? Well, <laughs> if you look at the at the at the, um, uh, at the string model, right, you recognize immediately that uh, there are uh, um, this is the formation of the strings, right? That uh, they form uh, <laughs> less and less as you pull them uh, uh, as you pull them too much. In other words, the elasticity becomes plasticity. Okay. And so the partial differential equations allows you to quantify that much more precisely. Plasticity means if you have an elastic body and you pull it, it comes back, but if you pull it too much, then it doesn't return to its uh, uh, initial position. So this is elasticity and plasticity. Uh, so it's an example of partial differential equations, right? And <coughs> Uh, so, so this is the case of a membrane that you pull and develop plasticity. The blue part is plasticity because you have pulled it too much. Uh, 
So you can pull it apart, that's fractured, okay? And uh, if, uh, there are, if you pull it in a, a, a skew, a skew uh, uh, direction, then that's dislocation. So these are all phenomena that you can prescribe with partial differential equations, right? Uh, but then you have to see that you can solve them. This is what can you do with these equations? So, uh, so the, the perspective of the PDE Earth then it is, uh, is, uh, is the following, that to do the PDE instead of the discrete phenomena, right, is much more conceptual. And uh, can see better larger scale organization of these interactions that are not apparent in the la lattice description. Uh, the presence uh, of elastic weight, the damping or modifications of perturbations, the organization of plastic regions of dislocation, etc., is much easy to detected if you do uh, use this this approach. Okay, uh, <coughs> so um, so here is a discrete and a continuous version of the elastic plastic material. Okay, and so basically the PD guides the discretization method because then once you have the continuous uh, description, you can discretize, and this is what people is doing in numerical analysis, you discretize based on the continuous uh, method, okay, and do the uh, numerical computation. And numerical simulation nowadays is uh, fundamental for basically any scientific uh, um, uh, advice. Okay, and so to finish, let me uh, show you a numerical simula simulation of the mantle flow on the, uh, of the Earth using a nonlinear Stokes equation. And this again is also from uh, colleagues at the Institute uh, in Austin. And they use, uh, as it's described here, a finite element simulation of uh, the convection uh, of the mantle, okay? So what I want to do now is I want to show you, I'll try to explain you three types of problems I have. Uh, so, so thank you for your attention in this. And I want to say this could show you, give you a glimpse of uh, three different type of problems that I have uh, studied in the past, okay? So, uh, the first one I want to do is, uh, right? Uh, so uh, <coughs> basically, the first observation I do is that the expected payoff here is going to be the same as the expected payoff a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left in the step. Because, you know, the, from here I'm going to go or here or here, right? So the expected payoff is, here is one half of the expected payoff to the right or to the left. And if you, so this is like a discrete partial differential equation. And if I do smaller and smaller steps and smaller and smaller deviation, then the expected payoff will satisfy a partial differential equation. It is a backward heat equation. In other words, the expected payoff, when I get to the wall, is one or zero. And then if I reconstruct backwards in time, then that is going to evolve like the backward heat equation, okay? So now suppose, so this is the partial differential equation. Now let me show you one of the things I have been work with, which is a obstacle problem. The obstacle problem is an American option. In the obstacle problem, right, I have to pay to, to play. So each time I did a stop, I have to pay a little bit, which means that I may end up having losing money, right? You know, before, I will always get the worst case scenario was zero. Here, I will can lose money. So the American option is a variation that says, at any moment you can stop the game and you go out and what you pay, you pay, and what you didn't pay, you didn't pay. Okay, so that changes my strategy. Okay, in other words, my strategy and the, the, if I do the expected payoff of solving the backward heat equation with this extra money, I could do negative. The, my my next new strategy is not just the positive part of the old strategy. 
Because since I know that I can quit at any moment, then I can take more risk, okay? And so the solution to that problem, right, is to construct the solution of an obstacle problem. That is, a function which is, when it's positive, it satisfies the equation, right? That if there is some region, which is the region where I have to leave the game, which is zero, but now the region where I will keep playing will be largely, largely and, uh, 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 extended by my knowledge that I, I, I can uh, leave the game. And so the solution is uh, the solution is something called the, uh, the obstacle problem that is that will come and, and become zero, but will come, become zero in a smooth way without, the, without forming an angle. Okay, so this is an example of, uh, uh, <coughs> of the uh, obstacle type problem. Uh, the, second, uh, the second example I want to give is of a, of a non-linear PDE is optimal transportation. Optimal transportation was proposed by uh, French Monge, the uh, Monge and Poor equation, many years ago, but nobody pays too much attention. Monge was a great scientist, but apparently one day he was walking and saw people transporting uh, a, a, a mound of earth from a place to, to fill a ditch, okay? And he says, well, there must be, you know, people went back and forth. He says, there must be an optimal way of transporting that. So the optimal way is such that if I have the cost of taking this barrel from here to there and this barrel from here to there, that I arrange it so as to minimize the transportation cost, okay? Now, if you do that in infinitesimal terms, that gives you a very nonlinear equation, okay? So what is the very nonlinear equation? It says, well, so, so let's think on the transportation as being a bunch of lines that, that, that join a point here to a point there, okay? The, the, orig the original point to the end point, okay? Then the first observation is, you, if you think of these lines as, 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 as rigid wires, right? The first observation is that you cannot rotate the wire. There is no rotation in the process, right? Suppose you have all the wires and they are parallel and you rotate the, the endpoints a little bit, so you are slightly changing the position of your delivery, then it's gonna be more expensive. So that means that the optimal transportation cannot rotate. And the fact that cannot rotate makes it the gradient of some other function called a potential. And the second, the second observation is that if I take here a little ball, right, and the image then is a little ellipsoid, right, the ball and the ellipsoid have to have the same volume. And this provides the second part of the partial differential equation. That partial differential equation is called the Monjamper equation. It's very, very nonlinear, but it's very important uh, in many areas. For instance, <laughs> there is a model uh, of a weather prediction, which is called the semi-geostrophic semi equation, right? Which is based in solving that problem. And it's based in solving that problem in rather difficult circumstances. And this is a theory that has been developed by several years now. And uh, Alessio Figali, right? <laughs> Who uh, got the, uh, the, um, the Fields Medal uh, recently, got the Fields Medal because solving an important part of the uh, Monjamper equation related to optimal transportation. And the third uh, thing I want to talk about is the Navier-Stokes equations. The Navier-Stokes equation, there are two great uh, important equations in fluid dynamics. One is the Euler equation, which are fluids that have no viscosity, like water. And so, uh, fluids that have no viscosity are more, you know, are, less controllable, is more, more uh, chaotic, right? Because they don't have ellipticity. Because the viscous, the viscous flow has hidden an ellipticity property, which is the following. Suppose you have this particle, this flow particle, the flow line uh, sort of uh, 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 traveling, right? In, uh, uh, the, uh, in, in space and time, right? <coughs> and one particle tries to 
sort of speed up respect to the, the, to the surrounding one, okay? Then, if you have a viscosity effect, the surrounding particles are going to break the particle. They will not let the particles sort of go uh, away uh, from them. And this is the same mathematical phenomena as the elasticity problem. In other words, the, uh, different phenomena that you know, have, so at the end of the day, the same partial differential equation. Uh, 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 so, so in the Navier-Stokes equation, right, what you have is the, this sort of this uh, ellipticity that sort of doesn't let the, the flow uh, uh, separate. You know? And so for one of the important uh, issues, you know, the, the Navier-Stokes equation is used in numerical simulation hundreds of times a day, because there are many, if you have something that transport dirt, you have something uh, that uh, uh, have what, any, many, many different phenomena, the basic the simulation is uh, uh, Navier-Stokes uh, Navier equation plus whatever else you need, okay? And so the question was if uh, the velocity could become infinite, and this is still open, it's one of the millennium problems, but many years ago, well, probably 15 by now or something like that, more, 20, okay. I proved with two great colleagues, uh, Bob Kohn and Louis Nirenberg, that if the velocity could become infinity, it would not, the, the, the singular set of infinite velocity would not be able to uh, even cover a piece of little curve in space and time. So the conclusion of that is, if the Navier-Stokes equation becomes infinity, you will never see it, okay? So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Caffarelli. Please take a seat here on the stage. The question and answer session is about to begin. May I also invite Professor Young to be seated on the stage too? Thank you for a most uh, stimulating uh, discussion, uh, demonstration as well. We don't see that often uh, uh, in mathematics. So are there any questions? Uh, oh, we have some uh, written questions, so let's see. Oh, okay, the first one. What's the commonality between partial differential equations and chaos theory? If there is any connection, is you know, in some sense, partial differential equations and chaos are opposite uh, concepts, right? And uh, so, I think if there is uh, some uh, some uh, connection, will be through statistics, right? In other words, to to see, to try to see what is uh, the order on chaos, right? Because the PD will give the order part of the chaos. In other words, even if you have something which is very chaotic, many times has uh, un underlying some organization, and I think that's what the partial differential equations will give. And thank you. So, and we have another one here. Uh, how does uh, partial differential equations, how can partial differential equations be applied in material science? Oh, they're, by, they're all over, partial differential equations uh, in material. Well, I talk about elasticity, a lot of plasticity, right? That's material science, in other words. Uh, uh, and uh, if you have, uh, uh, you know, a beam that is, uh, uh, is, is sustaining some weight above the weight that the form, right, is done through a partial differential equation, in other words. Uh, where you have to consider the forces on the boundary above and below of this domain, and you have to consider the uh, beam uh, uh, structure, right? Because you can have a beam which is formed by a bunch of layers, right? And then uh, that has, uh, um, so if you want to represent that by partial differential equation, then it has a very different structure, for, for instance, uh, the, if you have a beam with very thin layers and you want to know to how what happens, that is done by a phenomena called homogenization. Homogenization is a phenomena where you have uh, a, a, a material, right, 
which is, uh, has a very a complex local organization, right? Like if you have a mix of uh, two different metals, right? Or you have uh, in a wing of a plane, you have a lot of uh, little cracks, right? And you want to know what is sort of the view, the, the, the big scale view, you know, you can go and look at very thin, the small scale and see there are a lot of little cracks and you want to know what is the large scale behavior, then there is a mathematical theory using partial differential equations of what's called homogenization. You know, how do you see what is the big picture of the very complex uh, 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 tiny scale? Other questions? Perhaps I could come back to the first question. I mean, uh, everything you've talked about, uh, all the examples you've talked about, uh, is based on the assumption that the future of whatever system you are talking about can be predicted. Once you write down the differential equation, it's a deterministic system. Mm -hmm. But there must be uh, equations uh, which are sensitive to initial conditions in the sense of a positive yeah. Lipunov exponent. Mm -hmm. and, and those become chaotic. And even though you have the best differential equation in the world and a full set of initial conditions, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. can't predict the future. Yeah. Uh, have you done work in this area? I, I think that's maybe what that first question was about, chaos. Well, uh, no, I think the only way then that you can do is to re rethink your, your uh, structure uh, often, right? You know, solve a differential equation where the parameters are reconsidered uh, more or less constantly, right? In other words, uh, probably you, like if you do weather prediction and you have a storm, right, coming, then you can try to predict, but you predict for a time and then you have to reconsider according to the observation what you, uh, what was, what, how, what you can predict and also probably how long can you predict, right? In other words, you can, this is a problem of a stability of, of, uh, of solutions to differential equations. And so I, our solutions of differential equations which are very stable, right? Like a heat equation of a bar is a very stable process and you can, uh, can uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, predict it, right? Or there are, there are uh, partial differential equations which are associated to phenomena where, you know, uh, you, you can have a blow up in finite time. There is a lot of work on, on, uh, on how uh, some differential equation can uh, blow up in finite time. Can it blow up at a point? Can it blow up with tunnel of space? Does the blow up persist? Does the blow up uh, uh, immediately disappear? And things like that, yeah. Okay, here I have uh, uh, a few questions. Uh, this one seems interesting. Have you ever got ideas which contradict the theory we have built, I suppose, uh, in the past, uh, in order to solve that problem? Uh, uh, but perhaps well, I, I could amplify that a little before you answer. Uh, I mean, in, for example, cosmology, much of the advance uh, has to do with proving uh, previous beliefs to be wrong. But in mathematics, uh, that seldom happens. Uh, contradicting what we knew in the past? Uh, well, depends what you call contradicting what you, I mean, what you prove in the past, if it's well proven, is well proven. There is no way you can contradict yeah. it, you yeah. know. Uh, but you contradict expectations on the behavior of a given model, you know. Uh, so, so um, you know, basically, if uh, I... Now, I say, well, I really believe that Navier Stokes has no singularities, right? Has this little singularity, but I really, is that I could not prove that there was no singularity. I'm convinced that there would be no singularities. And somebody comes and proves or gives you an example that the singularity appear, that may happen. You know, in other words, there are, in mathematics, there are a lot of what's called conjectures, you know, which people say, well, you know, we, my conjecture is that this uh, is going to be smooth, or this is going to blow, or uh, this uh, or that. Uh, but so, so conjectures are very interesting and important things, but they allow for the fact that they can fail. That's why they call them conjecture. 
Now we have a question that was similar to another one that was asked in the previous session. How do you take a balance between family and research? <laughs> uh, but but I, I have to tell, tell members of the audience that the other Professor Caffarelli is also a mathematician. So. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of your duty <laughs> to balance. <laughs> no, well, I don't know. I think uh, we, we uh, had a happy family life when the children were small. Now my children are not children anymore, and they are spread all over the United States, but still, I think we are very close, and the three of them came here for the, for the seventh, so I think that that's a show that I wasn't that bad of a father. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a very general uh, question. Why do you love mathematics? <laughs> Well, it's something that ingrained in, you know, why uh, I like mathematics. It's, uh, when I was in high school, I always have this curiosity that, you know, that mathematics were provided, you know. Uh, uh, when I started the university, it was, uh, the disjunctive was uh, engineering, physics, or math, we went when I, while I was in the last year of high school, we went with friends and looked at some lectures. Engineering, we were not too convinced. Uh, uh, maybe because at the time, the engineering that they were teaching was not what it is today. Today, I think engineering is one of the most exciting uh, areas of science. You know, they have all these, these uh, issues uh, uh, that they are uh, discovering. But then I, I was, um, did math and physics. It was in the science uh, faculty, so you could do math and physics uh, simultaneously for a couple of years. And then at some moment, I sort of started to like more mathematics and, uh, and then just went by. <laughs> Um, as mathematicians, we appreciate the elegance of closed form analytical solutions, but that's hard work. You know, it takes many cups of coffee, many walks around the park, <laughs> waiting for that spark of inspiration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but these days, computational power is cheap. So we can build, you know, very finely tuned, very realistic systems of, of real systems not needing the, the full closed form solutions or partial differential equations, just some basic neighboring logic solutions. So how do you see, you know, what is the best way for science to advance given that? Well, the, 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 the mathematics plays an enormous role in, in engineering and simulation. I have the, 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 I have the lack of work with engineering groups in several places, right? And there are two aspects to the numerical simulation. You can do very precise simulation with the computer, but you have to understand the spirit of the equation. You know, in other words, I chat very lot with engineers, and, you know, and said, well, you know, we want to simulate what? What do you expect of this, right? Because there are cases in which you can do, like if you have flows, right? then you, in order for the stability of a flow, you have to do upwinding. In other words, you have to, 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 to create your iteration in a very particular way where this, you look at uh, this quantity x at t, uh, t plus, uh, at, at t plus epsilon minus the quantity at t equal to this, and you, this you can do it implicitly, that is putting it in the future, or explicitly putting in the past. And the way you have to proceed in, uh, for, for in that case is very linked to the underlying mathematics of it. So, so I think that mathematics goes hand in hand with engineer and with numerical simulations. In other words, math, the mathematics has a, a lot to give to uh, the way you simulate a given phenomena. Hello, Professor. Um, I, I'm thinking about a question. Is a is a when I see luxury when I when we are making hello I'm here <laughs> hello um, when I see lo lottery it, like Mark Six in Hong Kong 
Lok Hap Chai in Hong Kong is lottery. There's a, there, um, because when I, see, uh, when I see your examples, there's kind of some, uh, something like um, initial conditions. And every time when I see the lottery, the, they are, the balls are set up in the same, in the same way. But they are, every time when after the uh, lottery, they, are, they come up with different numbers. I'm thinking whether is it the initial conditions or the models that we, we are thinking is too simplified, or is it other like chaos or other way we should think about this question? Uh, what, what do you mean by lottery? So the lottery, the, lottery. The standard lot lottery ball and so on. Oh, the lottery ball and so on. So, yes. Uh, well, you know, uh, this, this is a matter of expectations, right? I gave this example of the the, uh, I gave this example of the random walk, right? And if you do a random walk, right, then your expectation can be reach this point, but it's just your expectation, right? Because if you uh, do random walking uh, right and left, right, you can end up everywhere, you know? In other words, the probability that you will end up far away is smaller, right, and the probability that you end up closer is bigger, but still, nothing is guaranteed. If you have a, a, a bunch of, uh, of balls, right, which are uh, a thousand ones and a hundred twos and twenty threes and so on, you most probably will get a one, but you can get a two or you can get a three. You know, this is this is in the randomness of the game. So, I say. Uh, is something that uh, all the mathematics was pre can predict is that you will get this number in proportion to how many times that ball is in the, in the box, that's all. Thank you, I think the short answer is just that that system has a positive Lupinov exponent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, we have uh, just time for a couple of questions. So I have five sheets here, but I think they come from two people. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe even one. So uh, I would just pick one or two that might seem interesting. Uh, what would you say to students who decide to pursue scientific research? Well, I, I think we are in an era where scientific research is, uh, is exceptional, right? It is uh, extremely exciting, you know. And uh, everything from a cell phone, what cell phone was 20 years ago to what it is now, to whatever example you can take, the prediction of typhoons 10, 20 years ago was much more sort of uncertain, right? Now you look at the TV and they tell you, well, in the three, three next day, the, the, the typhoon, which is something very chaotic, is going to be between these two curves and so on, right? And it's better and better and better prediction, right? So I think uh, this... Uh, uh, this is a great time for science. Uh, it is hard, you know, because the same way that it is uh, more and more precise, uh, it demands from the scientists to uh, have a more, uh, uh, you know, to better understand the confluence of different phenomena and things like that. But if you are willing to to try it, uh, science is, uh, is I think, an extraordinary future. Okay, uh, perhaps I'll just read out one final question and I will try to elaborate a little bit. Uh, the question, as stated here, is uh, how do you overcome obstacles in research? And I amplify it in the following way. Uh, in the sort of work that most, most of us, us do, mm -hmm. uh, we can succeed or we can succeed not so well, or maybe we do better, or we do uh, not, not so well. Mm -hmm. But in mathematics, either you prove it or you don't prove it. Uh -huh. So when you run into an obstacle, it may seem more difficult and perhaps even at times more depressing. Mm -hmm. You can't have partial success. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you deal with those times when uh, at least uh, for a while you can't solve the problem? Well, there is not much you can do with that, but I, if I can say a just suggestion is have a portfolio. <laughs> in other words, you know, you think about several problems and you get stuck in one for 10 years, but you work on the others and all of a sudden 10 years down the road, 
you say, oh, I, I can do this this way. So, you know, just do not, you know, put yourself and I have to solve this and only this. You know, let your mind uh, go around uh, and listen to interesting things from other colleagues and try to, f to, to put your hand on that, you know, this. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, that's all we have time for. So let us thank uh, Professor Caffarelli again. Yeah. Most interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Please return to your seats on the floor. The last session is on life science and medicine. It is our honor to have Professor Wai Yi Chen to be our moderator. Professor Chen, please. Well, I think our Lex Laureate exemplifies the importance of not to be limited by traditional belief and how important it is that proving something which a lot of people believe to be wrong is very important. So it is really my, my honor and great pressure and, and great pressure to introduce uh, Professor Mary Claire King, recipient of the Saul Prize in Life Science and Madison 2018. Professor King grew up in Chicago and received her BA, come now from Carlton College, Minnesota, her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and then her postdoctoral training from UC San Francisco. She's currently the American Cancer Society Professor of the Departments of Medicine and Genome Sciences at the University of Washington, Seattle. The Saul Prize is awarded to Professor King for her work in mapping the first breast cancer gene. Using mathematical modeling, Professor King predicted and then demonstrated that breast cancer can be caused by a single gene, which is actually at that time opposite that what was traditionally believed. She mapped the gene, which facilitated its cloning and saved thousands of lives. Professor King has spent most of her career addressing the epidemiology of cancer. A remarkable insight launched her efforts. It was well known that there were differences between populations in the incidence of the identical cancer. While other scientists did not pay particular attention to these facts, Professor King surmised that there must be a gene involved, and genetic strategy could be successful to discover it. So she committed to these nine of attack despite overwhelming skepticism from cancer researchers. Subsequently, by applying lineage analysis to a group of Ashkenazi Jews who had an unusually high incidence of early onset disease, Professor King mapped the gene, which she named BRCA1 to human chromosome 17 in 1990. She went on to show that the risk of breast and ovarian cancer among women with mutations in BRCA1 are very high, up to 80% lifetime risk for breast cancer and 50% life risk for ovarian cancer. Her discovery of the existence of a gene driving breast cancer was key to the final cloning of the gene. More, re more recently, her group developed a multi-gene platform to simultaneously detect all classes of mutations in all breast and ovarian cancer genes. This platform has now been put into widespread clinical use. As a direct result of her efforts, there exist tests for the BRCA1 mutations. These tests have saved and prolonged the lives of countless women around the world. Professor King's approach to gene discovery is a model for the detection of severe mutations in common complex disease. This approach has been the basis of gene discovery in diabetes, colon cancer, coronary heart disease, artery disease, hypertension, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and other complex traits. In addition to the identification of the mutation of BRCA1 as a cause of breast cancer, Professor King also pioneered the use of DNA sequencing for human rights investigations, developing the approach of sequencing mitochondrial DNA preserved in human remains, then applying this method to the identification of kidnapped children in Argentina 
and subsequently in cases of human rights violations uh, on six continents. Dr. King's contributions to science has earned her a number of honorary doctoral degrees. She has been elected to membership of a number of lamed societies, including the Lesson Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American of the Academy of Medicine, the American Philosophical Society, and a foreign member of the French Academy of Sciences. In 2014, she received the Alaska Special Achievement Award for Medical Research, and in 2016, the United States National Medal of Sciences, in addition to the Saul Prize this year. So let us welcome Professor King to the podium. Thank you very much, Professor Chun. Because the session today is intended to be question and answer, I asked my students before I left Seattle for some examples of questions. I thought perhaps that would warm up the audience, like John Stewart, that if I begin with some questions that I brought from home and I answer them, perhaps then you will feel free to ask me more questions. So I will, t I will tell you the questions that my students suggested that they would ask if they were here. Some of these students are from Hong Kong, but not all. <laughs> First question was, so I have read about this Shaw Prize. What's similar about the three different prizes? Astronomy? and mathematics and medical science seem superficially very different. Are they really that different? Or do you think that Mr. Shaw had some common theme in mind? I think perhaps Mr. Shaw did have a common theme in mind. I think perhaps from what we have heard this afternoon that we understand that astronomy and mathematics and genetics all have the goal of allowing us to make sense of the natural world, of allowing us to make models, intellectual models, of the way we believe nature might work, and then to pose questions rigorously about those models and to test our questions, our conjectures or our hypotheses with data sometimes data that is purely observational, as for cosmology, but other times data that is the result of experiment. But for all three disciplines, the capacity to try to bring in our minds order to what otherwise seem like purely chance or noise events. So a related question is, what's the difference between the elements of a question that one can determine and the elements that one cannot determine. In this way, I think that astronomy and mathematics and biology might be a little different. Each of our ways of thinking has a core of bringing order to what we, what we experience that has a deterministic part. But the non-deterministic part in my world, in the world of genetics, has a component that is environmental, that is the physical environment that the individual experiences, a component that is behavioral, what an individual chooses to do, and then a component that is purely stochastic, purely by chance, whether mutations do or do not occur. So each of us is working with a, a set of features about which we can make predictions that we believe are quite sure, quite determinative, but surrounded by major features that may not be determinative, that may be, in some global sense, chance. Next question. What is it that I do, and why should Mr. Shaw have given me a prize for it? 
So what I do is genetics. Genetics is the coolest thing ever. Don't let anyone convince you that astronomy is better or even mathematics is better. Genetics is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and, and it's particularly fabulous because it allows you both to do really pure creative work in the sense that I was just saying, in the sense of making predictions about the natural world, and to do that work in the context that's very useful to people. In this case, useful to their health, useful to having children born who are well. Genetics allows us to understand how traits are passed from one generation to the next, obviously across all species, and indeed how species evolve from one another. So in my experience, having begun my work in evolutionary biology, understanding the differences between us as humans and our closest, our closest living relatives, chimpanzees, led me to, to both learn and then develop some of the, of the ways of thinking, some of the mathematical and statistical ways of thinking that I could then apply to a much, much, much shorter period of evolution, namely the evolution of, of particular mutations in particular genes that had very specific effects, namely predisposition to cancers. So genetics is a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking about transmission of differences and a, and a, a way of setting up predictions that one can then test from observations of whatever one is interested in, whether it's human genetics, plant genetics, genetics of, of yeast, genetics of bacteria, and so on. So the next question is, how does one decide what problems are interesting to work on? I think that's a great question. For a geneticist, the problems that are interesting to work on can come from many different many different experiences, in part an interest, say, in evolutionary biology. But in my experience, as I moved from an interest in evolutionary biology to interests more in problems of medicine, since I'm not clinically trained myself, the problems that, that I chose to work on were very frequently presented to me by someone else, by a physician, by a surgeon, by people who had actually had a child with a particular condition, by parents, in other words. So people with, as we say in the States, people with boots on the ground from, a, you know, from, the, from the Wild West in America, oh, you know that guy, he's got his boots on the ground. That means he's actually out there moving cattle around. He's a guy of the land. He knows exactly what he's talking about because he lives the experience every day. So for someone like me who has a set of a, a way of thinking at my disposal, namely thinking about genetics, if someone comes to me with a particular problem and says, what do we do about children who are born with this condition? My response is to think, is that condition genetic? If it is, can I find the gene that is responsible? If I can find the gene that is responsible, and if this is a congenital, that is to say birth, defect or birth problem, can I enable my colleagues who are physicians to use that information to enable those parents to have the next pregnancy be for sure healthy? And the answer is yes, I can usually do that now. Even three years ago I couldn't have done it, but now I can. So that's the next question. What is genomics? How does it differ from genetics? and how are they related to each other. So genomics is a set of tools. Genomics represents our capacity to understand the underlying sequences of a vast number of different species, and within any species of interest to us, the sequences of a very large number of individuals of that species. So the human genome sequence that any of us could look up right now on our cell phones if we wanted to, is a reference sequence, which is in fact an amalgam of sequences of, of many different people. Each of us, of course, has most of our human genome sequence of each of us is identical to that sequence, but every thousand base pairs or so will have a difference with that sequence. 
So each of us can determine now, literally, what our sequence is and how it differs base pair by base pair from that reference sequence. That is now a straightforward thing to do. Anyone in this room could do it with a little bit of training. My graduate students do this routinely. Undergraduates now do this routinely. Even, again, five years ago, that would have been a complete fanciful thing to suggest. And when I began my, my work in genetics, it would have been, at, we didn't even imagine it would ever be possible, completely out of the question. So genomics gives us a very powerful set of tools, because if one knows every single base pair that underlies the sequence of any person that one needs to understand, parents of a child who've been, who has a very serious uh, birth defect, if one can determine the sequence, the complete sequence of that child and of both parents, one can understand what has been inherited or what has come to be anew in that child that was not present in either parent, a new mutation that is the cause of their disease. So genetics can happen either new or by inheritance, and obviously both can matter. Genomics also gives us sister tools. We can understand complete RNA sequences. We can understand complete protein sequences. We, we can increasingly understand changes that are not changes of the sort I just described, genomic changes, but are changes in what happens to the DNA in the way it is, it is conformed. So the way that DNA interacts with itself, which may not be transmitted to the next generation, but is absolutely critical to the development of a cell called epigenetics. So we have this vast number of tools. I think it's very important, if one is coming up in the field now, to not let the tools take over your way of thinking. To me, there is a natural parent-child relationship between genetics as a way of thinking and genomics as a set of tools. I think we are asking the same questions now in genetics that people have asked for, since there have been people, for thousands of years before anyone ever coined the name genetics, let alone the name genomics. Questions like, what is it that makes us human? Why are some children born with terrible problems? Why are people different, differ, different from each other in lovely ways? Why do some people develop serious illnesses when they age and others stay healthy for a very long time? Really fundamental questions that we can read about in ancient literatures of all, of all major cultures. But now, for the first time in the last few years, we actually have the capacity to answer those questions. There is, I think, in genetics, almost no question now that, that people of your generation cannot hope to answer. So in this way, it's fundamentally different than mathematics. <laughs> mathematics will always have profoundly difficult questions that may or may not be solvable. Genetics has those same profound questions, and they are now solvable. And you all have the potential to enter this field at exactly the moment you can solve it, because the tools are so powerful now for doing it. Next question. Um, maybe I've already answered this one a little bit. Why is genetics useful? It's, it's useful because it tells, it tells us not only beautiful things, but it tells us about ourselves in useful ways. It tells us, it, in a very reductionist, literal sense, why did this woman develop breast cancer and this woman not? Why was this child born with a severe birth defect and their, and their brother not? And so on. And we know the answer to that. It's not mystical. It's not God's will. It's because of particular base pairs that have gone awry. And furthermore, we can intervene so it doesn't happen again or we can develop a tool that allows us to treat the consequence of that difficulty. Let's see, what's the next question? Oh, how did, how did I start in genetics? This is a question, for someone of my age, this is a, a non-trivial question, because when I was first in, in high school and college, genetics was not analytic. Genetics was purely descriptive, and then, to be honest, not very interesting. 
It wasn't even clear how many human chromosomes there were. Uh, there are, in fact, 23 pairs of human chromosomes, but that was only fairly recently sorted out. You had to be able to visualize them clearly in order to count them. And, and to, to enter a field that is purely descriptive, when all one can do is just memorize facts, is not something that ever appealed to me. I, I, to be honest, I loved math, and I did math, but it was, it was very obvious to me by the time I finished undergraduate school that I was not strong enough to be a pure mathematician. I'm pretty good at it. I'm nowhere near like Dr. Casarelli. Nowhere, not even the same planet. <laughs> but I liked that way of thinking. So my, my undergraduate math teachers, uh, they obviously recognized that I was pretty good, but not good enough to, to be a theoretician. And they said, why don't you consider doing either applied math or statistics? And you can see that that's not the same as, as addressing truly profound questions of the sort that Dr. Casarelli does, but it does allow one to use the fact that one can write down some equations and make tests from them. And they said the best, best place to do that is Berkeley. True, Berkeley's fabulous. This is before I knew about Hong Kong, it's true. But, but. So, I, so off I went to Berkeley from Minnesota as a, as a young person and, and never looked back. And got to Berkeley, and when, when you, you go to a wonderful big university, you all know this experience if you're at university here, there are many courses that you never even heard of before you entered university. And, and I knew nothing about genetics except the, my misimpression that it was still descriptive. So I took a genetics course just for fun from Kurt Stern. It was the last time he taught it before he retired and he was one of the founders of modern genetics. And, and it was analytic. It was all about stating a hypothesis and then testing it, usually with fruit flies, usually with Drosophila. And I thought, this is so fine. I mean, imagine being paid to do this. This is just the best thing ever. And so I, I asked my advisor from statistics, whose name was Jacob Urashami, and he was a very good friend of Dr. Stern. I said, would it be okay with you if I did some genetics? And he talked to me for a while, and he said, you actually want to transfer to genetics, don't you? And I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he said, have you talked to, to Dr. Stern? And I said, no, not yet. I wanted to talk to you first. And he said, well, he said, he is a good friend of mine. I'll talk to him. I think it will be OK. And that was that. By the next day, I, was I had transferred to genetics, and I've never looked back. And Dr. Urishami remained you know, very supportive of me. He was a wonderful teacher. And, and he supported my, my making this shift. But of course, it was difficult to make this shift, even though I was still very young. It was difficult to make the shift because I had no experience working with my hands. And genetics is, is an experimental field. So I had very patient teachers that really allowed me to make many mistakes. And you will find the same. If you're moving from a field like mathematics, where it's all in your head, <laughs> to a field like like genetics or, or developmental biology or molecular biology where you need to actually do experiments with your hands, your, your teachers will understand that you won't be as quick as someone who has, who has done biology for years and years. And that's okay, you get, you get better. You get better, you practice and you get better. And for me, the capacity to integrate, you, you said five minutes or three minutes, five? Right. For me, the capacity to integrate the way I thought about um, stating hypotheses with equations and the way I came to think about stating hypotheses uh, with genetics as a way of thinking was, it was organic. It didn't happen overnight. It took years to, to kind of develop. And I think the first time I ever did it in a really reasonable way was this hypothesis uh, that humans and chimpanzees were, were very, very similar at the level of protein sequences, and yet clearly very different in, in relative lengths of our bones, so in anatomy, um, in behaviors, in ways of life, and how could we reconcile very great similarity at the molecular level with very great differences at the level of organism. And then the hypothesis which in 1975 one could only state, but one could not yet test, was that the critical differences between our two species were not, were demonstrably not, the accumulation of small differences in proteins, but were 
Dr. Wilson and I hypothesized, the difference in the timing and mode of expression of genes. And with the, with the um, ultimate revelation of the human and chimpanzee, chimpanzee genome sequences, that has indeed proven to be the case. So the fact that, that it was possible to integrate um, conceptual thinking about these ideas with experimental tests of them was something that I learned while I was still a student and then had the enormous pleasure of applying to a wide variety of different conditions ranging, as, as, as Dr. Chen has said, from breast cancer on the one hand to human rights problems on the other. So let's have, let's, let's go on to part two, right? Thank you very much, Professor King. Please take a seat here on the stage. The question and answer session will begin. May I also invite Professor Chen to come to the stage, please? Thank you. So I'm sure you have a lot of questions for Dr. King. Yes, over there, over there. Over there. Test, test. The second row there, yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi, Dr. King. Thanks so much for your talk. It was um, really inspirational. I think for a lot of students like us, when you know we're in high school or still studying undergrad, we might not still have a very clear idea of what we're going to do with our careers. And you know, your story is kind of really something that tells us even if what you're studying right now is something you enjoy, but might not be something you see yourself doing for your whole life, it still opens the doors for a lot of things. So that's that, that's the part I really loved about your speech. Um, questions. Number one is you talked about how um, when somebody approaches you with, for example, a disease, and how do you decide whether or not you're going to study it? And you talked about how um, you know you look at, for example, is it genetic? Um, something like that. I'm just wondering, you know, what are the other factors that influence your choices? Because, you know, I know that you don't just work in breast cancer research, which is amazing. Um, and it's a, very, it's a very huge thing. It's a very prevalent disease. But you also have done amazing work in schizophrenia and, you know, non-syndromic deafness. Now, these are much more rare diseases. And, you know, I've worked in a lab where we, we, we studied rare diseases. It was on myotonic dystrophy type 1. And so those, um, those trinucleotide expansion diseases, also spinal cerebellar ataxia. So these are very rare diseases. And I remember my PI told me, you know, it's, um, it, it gives him a real drive studying for this because uh, it's, a, it's not always easy to get funding for these kind of projects because it's rare. And therefore, you know, pharmaceutical companies might not have the incentive to to, to get money into that, and so on. So, you know, how do you decide, well, I'm gonna go into breast cancer, or now I'm gonna look into schizophrenia? Um, and also, what are some of the challenges in terms of, you know, convincing uh, people to give funding for it? Because at, at the end of the day, science is a really expensive process, right? If you don't get the funding, it's very hard to make progress. Thank you, thank you. No, those are, those are excellent questions. My entire career has been based on public funding or foundation support. I have never taken money from pharmaceutical companies. I don't know if you have that luxury here, but uh, it, it, set, it, it sets up a parallel set of questions, but it's not the same set of questions. So I, I don't ever address the question of um, will I partner with a pharmaceutical company. I simply don't do it. I mean, people do, but I don't. So it's a, it's a different, it's a slightly different set of questions in that one dimension. Um, in terms of the more fundamental question of how does one decide on what to work on, um, the example you gave from your own lab is really an excellent example. And let me just amplify for people who don't know. So I, I don't, whose lab are you in? Who's your PI? Right, quite so. So a very distinguished lab. The, this laboratory works on a number of conditions that are individually rare but they share a, a profound genetic mechanism that is of enormous importance, which is a particular kind of mutation that is represented by an abnormally long sequence of what, under normal circumstances, is a sequence of much more um, constrained length. And the ability to identify these abnormally long sequences is a, is a technologically 
very difficult challenge, and this lab is one of the best in the world at doing it. So despite the fact that the conditions that are caused by these mutations in different genes are individually rare, the capacity to identify them um, technologically is itself just a real coup. It's a, it's, it's a real master stroke. So I'm sure that, that I, don't know, I don't know your PI personally, but, but given the reputation of the lab, I suspect that having developed the technology to be able to work on those conditions really inspires your PI to work on one and then another and then another. Um, in my case, it's a, it's a little different. Um, it, well, it's similar in that genetics is genetics, and so I like to work on conditions for which I'm reasonably convinced there will be an underlying genetic factor. Having come both from genetics and epidemiology, I very much respect the possibility that for many conditions, there is nothing genetic going on at all. That, what's, that the cause of the condition, for example, lung cancer in families or asbestosis in families, is, is an exposure to a mutagen. It, I shouldn't say there's no genetics. There's no inherited genetics. There's genetics in the sense of aberrations at the level of the cell, but due to a physical exposure. But if I believe that there is potentially a component that is an inherited component, it appeals to me intellectually, and it appeals to me as something I can potentially do. I would say that the, after that, the major determinant for me is of whether I should work on a condition is whether I have a, a clinically well-informed colleague who can help me, who can partner with me, and whether between my colleague and me, we will be able to work with um, patients and families who have that condition in a way that from the, the point of view of the patients and families is meaningful and useful. So it's really a, a triangle at each step. Okay, so I have a philosophical question. So what makes us human? <laughs> what makes us human? So we still don't know exactly what makes us human. Um, I, I, I retain the conviction that it has to do with the, uh, the timing of expression of genes that we share with our cousins, the chimpanzees. It's not that our sequences differ. Mm -hmm. Some friends of mine, for example, Evan Eichler in my department, a friend of yours also, is devoted to the idea, well, he, he shares my view, but he's also devoted to the idea that there are some genes that, that humans make that are just normal, everyday, important genes for brain development that are not made by chimpanzees. Fair enough. I mean, that's certainly true. That's tautologically true. But are those the defining features that make us human? I am not so sure. <laughs> I, I think it's... the. I think it's the timing during fetal development, and in particular during brain fetal development, um, of, of, of a whole variety of, of different genes that now have very highly programmed mm -hmm. um, developmental trajectories in each species, and that the evolution of those different developmental trajectories, uh, which are driven by, of course, expression levels, are are what make us human. And so it's a, it, it, it's a hard problem to solve. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a one-size-fits-all problem. Right, right. So the next question is, how do you see for, how do you foresee human future evolution? That means how do you foresee? Right. How do I see, foresee human future evolution? Um, I foresee it as social evolution rather than genetic evolution. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite examples is um, skin color. So almost everyone in this room has light skin. So none of us have the original human, almost no, no one in this room, has the original human skin color, which is dark. Why is the original human skin color dark? Because, it, because dark skin um, it, it protects the, the organism from too hot sun rays and from development of skin cancers, from development of overheating, and from a development of all kinds of conditions that would have been damaging in an equatorial climate. When people began to, modern humans began to leave Africa about 100,000 years ago and move north and then either west or east, what did they encounter? Well, half the year they encountered dark. So, 
how evolutionarily, how did we as a species cope with dark? We lost, in several different ways, the capacity to make melanin. So we have a whole variety of different forms of light skin in this room, and we have different forms of light skin and the kinds of hair stuff and color of eyes and so on that go along with it, because we have different, we have lost our capacity to make melanin in our skin in different ways as a result of different mutations and different genes. But it all has fundamentally the same phenotypic consequence, namely light skin. Well, this was terrific until modern humans decided to move to Australia, right? Sun, hot, melanoma. Did these people develop dark skin? No, they wore hats. So I think that the next steps of human evolution are wearing hats, wearing eyeglasses, developing insulin, developing chemotherapies, in other words, w developing mechanisms of dealing with the ways in which we are um, imperfect in an evolutionary sense. Yeah, I agree. You agree? <laughs> there you go. As a glasses wearer, you should agree. <laughs> right. Okay, so the next question. How does your work apply to human rights? So please give a concrete example. All right. Um, yeah. Well, there's a lot of them. <laughs> uh, I'll give a very brief example of the, of the work with the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina. This is work that I began at the request of the grandmothers, so it's another boots on the ground project. In 1983, toward the end of the Argentinian period of dictatorship, and the grandmothers were interested in finding and proving the identity of their grandchildren who had been, in hundreds of instances, kidnapped at the same time that their adult children had been disappeared and murdered. And they came to me through a series of friends of friends to ask me to solve this problem. And I was, I had, I mean, I didn't know how to do it, but I was quite sure I could do it because it was a genetics problem. I had taught in, in South America and understood what they were asking and why. And to be honest, because it was exactly the age of their kidnapped daughters, and my daughter was exactly the age of the grandchildren they were trying to find. So I signed on to try to do this problem in what I thought would be, to be honest, I thought it would be a, a, a symbolic way, but it turned into a 30 plus year uh, partnership that has returned hundreds of young, now of course almost middle aged adults, to their families. And, and this, the technical specifics of what, of what I did or what we did together were to develop uh, so bear, this was began in, the, in 1983 or so, so bear in mind this was just before Y.W. Kahn had, had developed the use of DNA polymorphisms to differentiate people. So DNA was not being used in this way yet. So at first we worked with protein differences like blood groups, which of course are don't distinguish people from, they distinguish people from one another, but, but not at a really fine-grained level. And then it was clear that, obviously, that we needed a much more fine-grained system. So with the help of my former advisor, Alan Wilson, with, with whom I had worked on the chimpanzee problem, um, we developed mitochondrial DNA sequencing as a tool that would allow us to uniquely specify every maternal lineage in Argentina. And therefore, when a child was identified by the grandmothers as a probable kidnap victim, the child having been either born in captivity or kidnapped as a prelingual infant, so the child had no way to know that she or he was a kidnap victim, but the grandmothers had circumstantial evidence to suggest that might be the case, we could apply mitochondrial sequencing to the child and, because mitochondria is specifically maternally inherited, to any maternal relative. So the mother, in essentially all of these cases, was disappeared and, and dead. But the maternal grandmother, or a brother or sister of the mother, or a brother or sister of the maternal grandmother would still be living. You can, just, you can keep going this way. You need any one maternal relative, and you can match the sequences. So we built up a data bank in Argentina of mitochondrial DNA sequences of all of the families who had lost adult children and, and grandchildren. And then as the grandmothers found 
children um, in a whole variety of circumstances that led them to believe these children might be kidnapped victims, we were able to match them. We then moved on to develop the use the same technology for identifying remains by removing DNA from teeth. So we would, when as remains were unearthed, uh, we would take a tooth. We would. I, th I used to think of teeth as diamonds. You cleave the diamond. You cleave the tooth in a with a sterile cleaver. Remove the pulp. Sequence the DNA, and then you have you have a DNA now of your murder victim, and you can match that. DNA to people who are survivors of a series of murder victims. So that's a concrete example. And that approach is now used, of course, worldwide for both um, man-made and natural disasters. Great, great, thank you. Now the next question, as I told you, there will be a lot of questions, so yeah, yeah. maybe we need another hour. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll try to make answers shorter. <laughs> so besides mastectomy, what other technologies do you look forward to? to prevent breast cancer after being screened positive for mutated BRCA1 gene. Right. Right. The, the, um, the question of whether we ha can have non-surgical options for preventing uh, development of, of breast cancer in BRCA1 and BRCA2 carriers is clearly of enormous importance. Let me first distinguish the, the issue of breast cancer prevention and ovarian cancer prevention. For preventing ovarian cancer, which in some ways is more urgent because it's far more frequently a fatal disease, I, I think the surgical option is acceptable because it involves removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes of a woman after she has finished childbearing with replacement, low-level replacement estrogens until she reaches the natural age of menopause, so typically about a decade. For about a decade after the surgery, the surgery itself is, is very straightforward. Uh, so for ovarian cancer prevention, I think that we'll, the surgical option will remain enormously important for the indefinite future. For breast cancer prevention, the ovarian surgery helps because the level of estrogen is reduced. And the question of whether there is a non-surgical option that is breast that will be specific to the breast is obviously of great interest. There are such options. I mean, a person could now, a person who found herself in this situation, could now take tamoxifen, and it would reduce her breast cancer risk by half. I don't know, well, very few women would be willing to do that. The side effects of taking tamoxifen indefinitely are not, are not pleasant, and quality of life is of enormous importance. So what we need is a medical intervention that has the, the um, basically the anti-estrogenic effects of tamoxifen, but without many of the side effects, which range from, oh, there's a whole variety of yuck that one goes through taking tamoxifen. And those of you who have done it know what I'm talking about. So, so it's a challenge. It's, 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 of course, not my specialty, but there are people in pharmacology working very actively on it. Okay, the next question. Genetic research in the past uh, it was quite difficult. How do you overcome these problems? Right. I think one thing about doing science, and I was really struck from both of you were talking in the same way, that when you, we're all about the same age, and when you're young and you've just entered your field, of course it doesn't strike you that the technology is absolutely hopeless and primitive. You know, you think it's totally cool and wonderful because it's new compared to what your professors had. So you're always asking questions that are just a little bit too difficult for the technology you've got to work on them. And then as you, as you get older and you get involved in the technology development yourself, you think, how the hell did I ever do that? You know, why didn't I just just wait. <laughs> and why did I spend 17 years mapping BRCA1 when I could now have a graduate student do it in the course of a rotation? You know, why, why, why? Well, you did it because it was there, right? and you wanted the answer, and you wanted it now, and you didn't want to wait until somebody else, maybe you or maybe somebody else, developed genome sequencing. So we're always pushing against the technology, and there's always a parallel. It's, 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 we could describe this with a differential equation, right? <laughs> there, there's a parallel elasticity between the development of technology and its application. And as you apply a technology, you think, damn it, I need this. I mean, th this is how I started thinking about um, epigenetic analysis. I thought, 
there's more going on in these tumors than is genomic. We've got to be able to look at methylation profiles. How are we going to look at methylation profiles? We should be able to look at methylation profiles in the same way that we look at somatic genomic profiles and so on. So the, the, a small success breeds another question, breeds another technological development, breeds another question. So it, 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 and of course there's a whole community of people worldwide asking the same things. So what are the difficulties faced uh, when you map the human genome? Right. <laughs> well, I think they're exactly what we've been discussing. The, um, of course, it is now done, thank the Lord. No one ever needs to positionally clone anything ever again. You guys have no idea how lucky you are. Um, and the, the challenges were to, uh, that the technology was not ready yet. So to give, if someone said give a concrete example, to give a concrete example of why that was difficult, um, the, I'm not sure how far back to go, let me give a fairly, a fairly late on concrete example. The technology, even now, the, of, of rapid sequencing is, it's extraordinarily rapid and extraordinarily efficient, but all of the reads are very short. There are maybe 150 base pairs, right? Well, 150 base pairs runs you into an ALU sequence real fast in the human genome. ALU sequences are sequences of 350 base pairs that um, are repeated hundreds of millions of times in the human genome sequence, much less in chimpanzees, and as soon as you leave primates, you don't see them at all. But for the human genome sequence, they are just a, a, a real holy terror trying to get past. And how do you get past a 350 base pair sequence if you've got 150 base pairs? The way you do it is you have a framework of physical agents, um, a combination of artificial chromosomes built into yeast, artificial chromosomes built into backs, that is artificial human chromosomes, built into yeast, built into backs, built into other forms of vectors against which you play these short sequences. So it was, it was an enormous challenge in the Human Genome Project to move back and forth between massively parallel short sequence generation and building up the entire sequence against this physical backbone. And it was brilliantly done, brilliantly done. And, and one of the great coups of the international public human genome sequence is that all of that was publicly available, which meant any, any researcher anywhere could work on it in real time as it went along. So, so do you think that PEG bio using the long read sequencing will solve that problem? Right. So Dr. Chen brings up a, a, an extremely, extremely good point. There's a company called PacBio, which is very innovative, that uh, has developed a method of sequencing not 150 base pairs, but 15,000 base pairs in long stretches. Um, at, eventually, I think PacBio PEC biotechnology will be the technology we all use. Um, we do not use it now for two reasons. One is it's just hopelessly expensive. It's just right. over the top expensive. Uh, and it really is. I mean, it's not that they're jacking up the price. It really is. And the other is that it has a very high error rate. Yeah. Right. So when they get those two problems solved, and they will, we will all move from it and we will wave flags that say PEC bio on them. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, now, so this, this is not... Actually, the question is not correct, but anyway, I think you can explain it better. Why BRCA1 is specific? In fact, BRCA1 is not specific. Why is it specific for breast and ovarian cancer? So. Um, certainly, breast and ovarian cancer are the cancers that are most frequently observed among um, persons who carry damaging mutations in BRCA1. Um, we also know just very recently, it's a very recent data, so the questioner is certainly uh, um, excused for not knowing the, the publication. Um, very recent data indicates that among men who carry mutations, particularly in BRCA2, the risk of prostate cancer is higher. Although the risk of prostate cancer in men with BRCA2 mutations is not nearly as high as the risk of breast or ovarian cancer in women with mutations in either BRCA2 or BRCA1. Um, there's also an increased risk of pancreatic cancer, although blessedly the absolute risk is still low. And then um, a particular form of melanoma called ocular melanoma is, is at significantly elevated risk in BRCA2 carriers, although, again, the absolute risk is low. Um, why that constellation of cancers? Why not colon? Why not lung? And so on. It's, it's because the, the underlying biology of BRCA1 and BRCA2 is that, that these 
that the proteins encoded by these genes are part of a complex whose principal role is in DNA repair, which is, of course, a universal, a universal process. But they also, that same complex, also has a role in acting as what's called an E3 ubiquitin ligase for the estrogen receptor. Let me unravel that. That is, the complex adds a ubiquitin molecule specifically to the estrogen receptor, or to the androgen receptor, but to steroid receptors, allowing those receptors to be properly turned over and processed. So when, the, when BRCA1 or one of the other genes in the complex is, is destroyed by mutation, not only do we lose the DNA repair function, we also lose the capacity to, to turn over in a normal way um, the estrogen receptor, and therefore the intake of estrogen into a cell. So it makes a link between the cells that therefore become very vulnerable to, to surviving mutational attack because they have this fabulous estrogen milieu. I mean, they're riding on a high of estrogen, um, as opposed to, say, a colon cancer cell, which, it, when it undergoes the same mutational attack, just dies, right? which is what we would like it to do. So there's a link, I mean, partly I'm making this up in the sense that we don't actually have a, a, an, an, a mammalian model that will go through those steps. I'm putting together various cell models in saying what I'm saying to you, but I think it's pretty sound. So there's a link between um, proper turnover of steroid receptors and the tissue types that are, or the organ systems that are vulnerable as targets of loss of function of these genes. Another question, do you or can you measure the, wor the worth of research by the universality of the parameter being studied? For example, a median versus a hundred people with a certain disease. Okay, what, what the question asking is, uh, can you measure the value of a certain piece of research by how widely it is applicable to people, for example, right. affecting a lot so, of people. All right, good question. So to what extent does one's choice of problem or does the value of a problem um, depend on, this comes back to your point, depend on the prevalence of the disease in question? Um, I would say it does in part. I work on breast cancer in part because it's enormously important to women. But the work of your lab I think indeed points out the enormous importance of working on, on individually extremely rare traits because they reveal mechanisms that are of universal importance that transcend a wide variety of, of devastating conditions. And we can learn from virtually any condition that we solve genetically. I mean, your own work is a very good example of this. Um, every condition genetically solved opens opens a, a, a door of nature to a, to a new pathway and to a new understanding. So there, in that sense, every condition is related to every other condition. Right. Correct. We have five minutes. <laughs> okay. To what extent modifying human genes is ethical? Oh, right. So the question is what about modification of, of human genes? Um, those of you who are a little older will recall that oh, 20 years or so ago, there was a, a tremendous interest in gene therapy that is actually being able to introduce um, corrected genes for genes that had gone awry. And there were enough problems uh, in trying to carry out that therapy that it, it essentially really um, has been in recession for quite a long time. There are a few examples now where it's being done very nicely, but particularly with ocular problems, right? Uh, I think modifying human genes is in a way like any other medical advance, that it's a tool and there will be circumstances under which it will be useful. I, it, it, my sense, but of course I'm a product of my generation and so I, I may be proven wrong in a few years, but my sense is that these tools are proving more useful to us in terms of developing um, medical approaches that exploit experimental organism or experimental systems that are themselves based on, say, gene editing processes, rather than directly gene editing in the organism itself. Um, 
let me just mention, because so people who haven't met any medical training won't know about this. There is now a very straightforward way to integrate gene discovery with an obstetric technique called pregestational diagnosis. So if a family has had a, has had a birth that led either to a fetal death or, or well, or you know, had a pregnancy that led to a fetal death or to a child that died after birth from a devastating disorder, if that disorder is genetic, it can almost certainly be solved, I'm here to tell you, because it's one of the things we do. And then once you know the exact base pair that has gone wrong, one can then take, take um, parental gametes, that is eggs from the mother and sperm from the father, um, fertilize them in vitro in a Petri dish, test at the eight cell stage each of several different embryos, and determine which embryos do not have the mutant in question, and then implant that embryo back in the mother, and a healthy child will be born. It's not gene editing. It's not manipulating genes at all. But it is directly taking advantage of knowing exactly what the base pair is that went awry in the first place. And that's done routinely. It's done in this country. It's done in Europe. It's done in the States. And it's technology that's out there now. So we've really, I mean, I have nothing morally against having done this by CRISPR if that were necessary, but we haven't needed it. We just go right to PGD. So can I frame the question a little bit different? For example, like if there's a lady who has Huntington's, so if you take the oocyte from that lady, and in fact you know that that egg carries the mutated gene, right. is it ethical to, in fact, using CRISPR-Cas9 to edit that gene off, right. edit the gene out, right. and then use that, use that egg for fertilization? Right. And um, so the, the example is of Huntington's, which is a dominant trait. So we wouldn't need to do that. I, I have no moral objection to it, but we wouldn't need to because right. um, the, the, the gamete is haploid, right? right? So half of the eggs of this mother mm -hmm. do not have right. Her, right. Ex her expanded, coming back to this laboratory again, mm -hmm. do not have the expansion that leads to Huntington's. So we would simply, I mean, this is being done now, right? mm -hmm. we would simply select from this mother right. one of her ova right. that is perfectly healthy, that does not have an expansion, and then from her partner, sperm that is also healthy, and right. implant back in her uterus right. a child that they now know will not have Huntington's. Right. But, but in that way, you're not editing the genome, though. Correct, you're but not what, editing what I'm saying, What I'm saying is, is it ethical? If actually that egg is shown to have the mutated gene, and then now can one edit it? Right. Um, if I... If I believed that gene editing was far enough along now in humans that one could do the editing without the risk of introducing secondary mutations, I would have absolutely no problem with it. Um, gene editing in humans is still not yes, that, it's not. I mean, as you know, is, is, is not foolproof yet. Right. Um, gene editing in experimental systems is fabulous. It, it's not yet to, it's not yet right. foolproof right. enough for a use in humans, in my view. But it doesn't mean it's morally wrong. It's just not quite there yet. Right. right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So will the development... Are we up already? One minute, okay. One minute. <laughs> will the development of genomic study violate privacy? Oh. Will, will the development of genomic studies violate privacy? I worry about this a lot. Um, and let me tell you the way in which I worry about this. And, and it's not a way that you hear about in the press all that much. Um, I worry about it, and maybe this is not an issue here, but I live in a litigious country, a country where people bring lawsuits a lot. I worry about it as follows. Let's suppose that um, a couple is going through a very nasty divorce, and there's a dispute about child custody. It would be possible, if there were not privacy laws in place, it would be possible for um, the the wife to obtain a sample of the husband's DNA from his hair or whatever, right? To turn over that sample to an unscrupulous laboratory to sequence, and for this unscrupulous laboratory to claim falsely that that man had a gene that, that predisposed him to violence. And it would be very hard to disprove that. Mm -hmm. They could be making it up, 
but they, it would be difficult to disprove because they're not going to be making it up in a stupid way. They'll make it up in some clever way, but still evil, right? And and if he if if that's allowed to happen, she could preclude in, in my hypothetical. She might be able to preclude him from seeing his child on the basis of this scheme. So that's the kind of, I mean, partly because of my Argentina experience, I mean, I just really worry about what evil people will do if they can get a hold of tools. And, and we need to be able to use those tools, the good guys need to be able to control these tools, and people need to be able to control what happens to their own, to their own information. So I worry about that kind of scenario much more than, than I do about whether people ought to join studies or not. But I, I do worry about um, being able to identify in a public way of that sort um, uh, complete sequences of, of you know, just any of us. Well, because of time, I think I have to stop here. So let's thank Professor King. <laughs> and thank you very also much. all the laureates this afternoon for the inspiring and very, very interesting talk. Thank you for all the laureates. Thank you very much. Please return to your seat on the floor. And thank you, laureates and scholars, for sharing your experience in doing science. Meet the Shaw Laureates 2018, the challenges and the joy of doing science, Science Forum, is now concluded. We are deeply appreciative for the laureates and scholars joining this event, sharing their experience in their work with us, and giving their insights into the young one's mind on science. Thank you, and have a pleasant evening.